Imagine being born with everything and going out with nothing. That is the tale of Henry Poor, a man who was exceedingly wealthy until he wasn't. Hi everyone, Ken here. Today we are exploring the Poor Mansion in Manhattan. Make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. After graduating from Harvard in 1865, Henry William Poor headed off to New York City, where he launched a successful career as a stockbroker, working at his father's company, informally known today as the S&P. As the years went by, he made millions of dollars, but still could not compete with the likes of the Vanderbilts and the Astors, who built palaces facing Central Park. Nevertheless, he wanted a park-facing palace to call home. Further south in Manhattan, he came across the former home of Cyrus Field, at 21st in Lexington, facing Gramercy Park. The home was already a well-respected landmark in the neighborhood, and known, as Cyrus had launched the Atlantic Telegraph Company, running the very first telegraph cables across the Atlantic Ocean to connect the Americas to Europe. Henry Poor purchased the house from Field's estate, and hired prominent Gilded Age architect, Stanford White, to completely rework the interior without making any changes to the exterior. Entering the home through the lower level, you would pass through an all-glass vestibule to arrive in the entrance hall, where a potted plant was centered on a floor-to-ceiling marble fireplace, complete with statuary to support its upper mantle. The ladies' reception room was finished out with antique European furnishings over a herringbone wood floor and complemented by gilded wall panels, offering a light and airy feel as sunlight brightened the room. The gentlemen's reception room took on a darker, more masculine scheme, with leather wall panels above dark wood wainscoting and an imposing stone hearth. Mr. Poor had the door surrounds finished in bronze statuary, showing off a glimpse of the glamour his male friends would see later in the house. Returning to the entrance hall, we will begin making our way to the main level of the house as we pass by potted plants resting on solid blocks of marble. As we make our way to the landing, the main hall comes into view, with each section of the coffered ceiling boasting colorful murals to contrast with their marble surrounds. Stepping onto the marble floor, we can rotate around the central feature to get a better view of the alcove where the furs of polar bears surround a tiger's hide in the ingle nook. The fireplace, rising 14 feet, was finished out with masterfully crafted artisan stone relief work as angelic figures danced about vines and stone flowers. From here, we can turn around and admire the grand staircase, carved from solid marble, sweeping along a curving wall decorated with antique European tapestries. Making our way through one of the elaborate openings, we will view the dining room with floor-to-ceiling old-growth wood paneling finishing the walls. The room is flooded with light as the Jacobian ceiling dances its dizzying array from the dining room towards the conservatory. Here, a marble pavilion stands above marble floors, blindingly reflecting the sunlight through the leaves of exotic plants. Tucked away in the corner, we will find the door to the butler's pantry, hand-carved and decorated with wooden fruit. Cutting back through the main hall, we will find the library with floor-to-ceiling bookshelves packed with rare literature. The room was arranged with twin fireplaces at each end. You can imagine how warm and cozy this room would have been in the dead of winter to curl up and read a book on one of the overstuffed sofas while fires flickered at either end of the room. Now we will continue our tour upstairs to the third story, where we enter the drawing room. Stanford White designed this room to be like a treasure chest, displaying antique European tapestries on the walls and ceilings with furnishings and fixtures from more than 30 cultures. This grand room stretched from one side of the house to the other, doubling as the music room with harps, violins, and pianos sprinkled throughout. Leaving only enough space between items to walk around, Stanford White layered heavy and light decor with a mix of colorful patterns contained by classical architecture. The house continued with several bedrooms, each offering a retreat from the cluttered decor found in the public rooms. Each of the bedrooms, though simpler, were not less elegant, as they carried their own well-thought-out themes. The house even came complete with an indoor squash court offering views into the conservatory so that you would find yourself surrounded by plants and sunshine outside of the glass walls, almost forgetting you were in the heart of New York City. The mansion showed the world that Henry Poor was in fact a very rich man, but he would soon grow into his name. In 1908, 
his company crumbled and had to be reformed. By 1909, he had lost nearly everything and had to sell his house and auction off all of his decor to repay his debts. And in 1910, the developers who had purchased the house had it torn down to build a 12-story, cooperative housing complex which continues to stand to this day. While this mansion might be lost to time, we still have these breathtaking photos to remember not only the designs of Stanford White, but to commemorate the work of the forgotten artisans who realized his vision. Which part of this house was your favorite? Let me know down below in the comments section. And while you're there, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. I would also like to take a moment to say a very special thank you to our This House supporters whose names you can see on screen right now. If you would like to see your name on the screen and contribute in part to the production of these videos, join our membership program today. I'll see you next time on This House.